Now I'd like to introduce to you the amazing doctor that came up from California and give you a little history about that. So when I went to California, I saw Dr. Hewitt in the hallway and I said, hey, well, how do you feel about coming up to Canada to talk to some MS patients to just give us the truth and give us the facts since this is a procedure you've done for many years down there. This isn't new, this is an experimental, but that's what we've been hearing in Canada from the doctors that honestly this isn't their forte. So Dr. Hewitt said, yeah, line it up and I'll be there. And so my one city that I thought he'd speak at has turned into five because there's so much interest. There's so many of us that need to hear the proper facts on what CCSVI, this vascular procedure actually is. And I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Joseph Hewitt. He's a vascular and interventional radiologist. He practices in Costa Mesa, California. He's also board certified in phobology, which means vein sciences and is the only doctor that's trained with Dr. Hakey that performs the CCSVI procedure. Dr. Joseph Hewitt. Hi everyone. Um, thank you for welcoming me to your, your great city, Calgary, tonight. Um, it's actually nice to be back in Canada. Um, I live in the United States, as you know, and I've just, I'm going to be working my way across the western part of the country, eventually to Winnipeg, to where my father lives. I'm a little bit worried about seeing him. He's been kind of upset. I never get home often enough. He said to me the other day, he says, how is it that you're coming back to Canada to see all these MS patients when I can't even get you on the phone? <laughs> I said, Dad, it's simple. They're just yelling louder. I can hear them all the way down in California. So um, just by way of background, I've been treating veins, a lot of the same veins uh, that people with CCSVI have problems with for about 15 years. So it was really interesting about a year and a half when folks with multiple sclerosis just sort of dropped out of the sky and said, you know, hey, we have some of these same problems. Can you treat us? As a practice, we were very, very skeptical at first and, you know, almost really actually reticent to do the procedure. Having treated over 600 plus patients, now I can tell you that I'm a believer. Um, I've seen too many patients get better. Um, I've seen too many patients with significant changes in their clinical symptomatology. I'm sure a lot of you have heard and read a lot of things on the internet and there's all sorts of information floating around. Tonight I decided I just wanna perhaps cause a little trouble, stir things up a little bit. I'd like to talk to you about venous stenting, which uh, is probably going to make a lot of blood pressures rise somewhere around. <laughs> so uh, Synergy Health, that's the name of us. You might know us as Pacific Interventional. Uh, we decided we wanted to take a, a really focused approach to CCSVI, so we created a distinct part of our practice to really focus a lot of our clinical um, and research endeavors specifically on CCSVI, and that's why we came up with this name Synergy. So. Don't be alarmed. All right, Ashton. By way of an overview, uh, I'd like to give you a little bit of history of vascular stents, um, some of the uses that we have for stents in the venous system, some uses of stents in CCSVI, some of the potential issues with stents, and some closing remarks, some thoughts about um, current use and future trends. Way back in 1856, there was a dentist named Charles Stent who had a metallic molding compound. And that's where we get the word stent from. In 1929, Dr. Werner Forsman performed uh, one of the first cardiac catheterizations. Dr. Charles Dodder is a very important man in the world of interventional radiology. In 1964, at what is now the Dodder Institute, he performed transluminal angioplasty, which was really groundbreaking at the time and is really um, the foundation of a lot of what we're doing for you folks today. In 1974, Andreas Grunzig um, performed the first peripheral human balloon angioplasty. Actually, um, Dr. Dodder did it in, a, in an animal. 1994 was an important year. This is the year that the Palmas shot stent was approved by the FDA for use in people. And we'll get a little bit um, more into that in a moment. From 1994 to 1997, stents 
exploded and they started to be used quite frequently. More recently in 2003, drug eluding stents um, were FDA approved and these were approved to be used in the heart. So let's talk for just a moment about stents. Um, there's a lot of information about there about, you know, stents being arterial stents or stents being venous stents and I, I think um, what I'd like to express to you is that there really are, it, it's somewhat disingenuous to say that there's no such thing as a venous stent, okay? That stent that was approved in 1994 was a wall stent. And that wall stent was designed and approved to be used in the liver, in the biliary system. It was designed in the liver to treat people with bleeding esophageal varices. Since that time, a large majority of the stents that we've used were approved to be used in the same manner. Now, as physicians, we often use things off-label, and many of those stents began to be used in both arteries and veins. At this point in time, we use many, many stents in both arteries and veins, and they're the same stents. I think it's, again, somewhat disingenuous to say that a stent that is placed in an artery isn't appropriate for a stent that's placed in a vein. We've been placing stents in veins for decades, okay? Um, a lot of the stenting that we do for veins is done for central venous stenoses. Many of the same stenoses are similar stenoses that people with a CCSVI have. Um, it's a widely adopted technique. Like I said, it's been used for decades. The Society of Interventional Radiology, by way of example, has developed guidelines for performing stenting of central venous stenoses. If this wasn't a widely accepted procedure, there wouldn't be guidelines. Um, Having said that, however, I want to make one thing clear to everybody, that there is no conclusive patency benefit to using a stent versus balloon angioplasty. I would like to disabuse many people who think that if angioplasty isn't working for me, I automatically need a stent. I, I would ha have you keep in mind that there is no proven benefit in terms of long-term patency of a stent over balloon angioplasty, okay? So let's, let's get a few examples here. <laughs> You have to forgive me, I have a little bit of a cold. The first case of stent reconstruction was over 20 years ago. You can see, actually, I do have a pointer. This was a 55-year-old man with a disease process called retroperitoneal fibrosis, which is just a, a fancy medical term. It's fibrosis that builds up along the back of your body near your spine that in a sense reaches out and grabs blood vessels and closes them off, all right? That's what happened to this fellow. On your left in A, these are the iliac veins coming up through the pelvis. The IVC is a big vessel that brings all that blood from the legs back to the heart. That's been closed off. Even after balloon angioplasty, it's still closed off. And this guy, he had really massive swelling in his um, scrotum and his legs. Something needed to be done. The patient eventually received stents, and after the stenting, he now has a return flow of blood. This is a very common and well-accepted use of stents in veins. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of May-Thurner syndrome. May-Thurner syndrome is a disease process by which the iliac vein in your left leg is occluded or significantly blocked in large part due to the overlying artery. This is a little bit difficult to see, but these are some, there's some contrast in the veins trying to get back and it can't get back up into the IVC, okay? After angioplasty, we can see that there's a little bit of contrast in that occluded segment. This patient received a stent in his left iliac vein returned to full patency with flow back to the IVC. This is a very common use of venous stents. While I'm on the topic of Maythurner, I, I thought I might just take a slight bit of a tangent because we have a, a lot of people who come to our practice and a lot of people actually are led to believe that Maythurner has something to do with CCSVI and that almost routinely they should be checked for Maythurner syndrome. And I'd, I'd like to try and give you some factual information that will steer you away from that. Just recently at the Society of Interventional Radiology meeting, there was a paper presented 
160 patients that were being studied for CCSVI were also evaluated for May Thurner syndrome. In that study, they found that 17% of the CCSVI patients had May Thurner syndrome. In an asymptomatic population, papers that have been published show an incidence of between approximately 16 and 24%. Okay? So in other words, I'm sure you all can all figure this out without me telling you, basically there's no difference in the incidence of May Thurner syndrome in people with CCSVI versus asymptomatic individuals. And this really raises the question, should people with CCSVI be routinely evaluated for May Thurner? Probably not. If you have a history of left leg swelling or a thrombus in that leg, that could possibly be a reason to evaluate a CCSVI patient for May Thurner. But if not, we have to weigh the, weigh the risks of more radiation and more contrast to you, okay? So keep that in mind when you go to your doctor if you do think you have CCSVI and you start talking about May Thurner, realize that your incidence is no greater than anybody else's, okay? Another common use for venous stents is to treat SVC syndrome. This is more common in cancer. Now we talked about the IVC, it's the inferior vena cava. That brings, it's a big pipe that brings all the blood from your legs back to your heart from the bottom. The SVC or the superior vena cava brings all the blood from your arms and head back to your heart from the top, okay? In patients with SVC syndrome, this is your SVC, it's narrowed. You can see how that black line gets narrow, right? That's due to cancer. This is this poor man who has SVC syndrome. You can see how his face is all swollen. After he was treated, his face became unswollen. I'm going to show you how he was treated. Initially, he had a balloon angioplasty with a nice big balloon, very similar to the ones that we would use in CCSVI patients. This didn't work. There was persistent stenosis. And as such, he received a stent. The blood flow is so strong now that it doesn't even, it, it flows too fast for us to get a picture of it filling everything. He's got very good flow. And that's why his face decompressed. <clears throat> in my mind, one of, uh, a fairly good analogy at least in terms of venous angioplasty, for people with CCSVI is our dialysis patients. In our practice, we perform approximately upwards of 10,000 venous angioplasties a year on patients with um, dialysis problems. And many of them get central venous stenoses. They get internal jugular vein stenoses. They get subclavian vein stenoses. This is a patient with an anominate vein stenosis the anominate vein is, is right here. Basically, all the blood comes through your subclavian vein, through your anominate vein, and back to your heart through your SVC, okay? It's blocked. He received an angioplasty. That wouldn't keep it open, and he received a stent. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, I, I'm talking about stents here, and I know there's a lot of slides about stents. I don't want you to, to think that the knee-jerk reaction is to putting stents in. The rule is always angioplasty, 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 first and foremost. Putting a stent in is a last resort in every case. But in some cases, such as these, it's necessary. You, 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 on one side, you weigh all the goods. On the other side, you weigh all the bads. And in some cases, this is where you end up. Okay? Next slide. Another case of a dialysis patient, subclavian vein, blocked off. Actually, they get these because they have catheters in their veins. They have catheters that stay in their veins for too long, and it causes the, the, the vein to close off. Okay? gets scarred closed. And we had to put a stent in that individual, but it restored the normal flow. Okay. Let's talk about the azagus for a little bit. The azagus is a funny vein. It's an unpaired vein. Most things in our body, or many things in our body, are paired. It's like having a, a backup mechanism, right? The azagus vein is unpaired. It lies on the, mostly on the right side of our body. Um, the hemiazagus vein crosses over to the left side. It's an important vein to all of you folks here tonight because it turns out to be a pretty important component to drainage of our central nervous system. Okay. This is an MRI. We call it a sagittal MRI. Sagittal just means basically up and down. If I were to look at you kind of from the side, kind of from the front, this is sort of what your azagous vein would look at and your hemiazagous down here coming off of it. This azagous vein doesn't look too bad. It, it, it doesn't show any significant narrowings. This, however, is another azagous vein. You can see the, the heart is down here, 
This is almost looking at it kind of from the side again, okay? The heart, there's your aorta, and here's the azacus vein in the chest. And we see some areas that are significantly narrowed. If we were to take some sections through there, sort of like a meat slicer and just, you know, cut a couple pieces of bologna, this is what it would look like. And you see the azacus narrowed there and narrowed here, okay? That may or may not be significant. You know, it's not a knee-jerk reaction. We don't say, you know, we see that, something's bad. You know, we got to think about it a little bit. So we take the person to venography, and we put our catheter nice far down, as far as we can go. And in some patients such as this, we see something like this. This patient has a nice big azacus vein down here, showing that there's a lot of flow, and it reconstitutes. But then we see a lot of collateral vessels, okay? A lot of collateral vessels. When we look at this and we look at the drainage going into those vessels, um, we're going to try an angioplasty. And we angioplasty it several times in a row at least, trying to get it to stay open. And then we're going to look at the azagous vein in inspiration and expiration to make sure that this just isn't transient. It's not just a temporary problem. And again, once we weigh all of these factors, pros and cons, every once in a while, we'll end up having to put a stent in. And in this case, that stent restored very good flow into the SVC. We try and avoid putting the stent in. Sometimes we need to. So here's a couple of pictures of an azagous vein. And this is a good example. When we look at it here, this is an example of an azagous vein where we look at it and we see the flow and we see this long narrowing. Okay? And some practitioners may think, okay, I'm going to angioplasty that and it doesn't respond and an angioplasty of that and it doesn't respond, so I need to do something more significant. It's important to take a look at that person in an inspiratory or expiratory view, whatever the opposite of this was, and you'll see that it plumps right up. So again, I guess this is my way of trying to emphasize to you that when you're talking to your doctor about what's going to be done to you and they show you an MRI, for instance, that shows a problem with the azagous, you really want to ask these questions and say, okay, what's your plan? You know, how do you treat the azagous? You know, what do you do to make sure? Because if you can avoid having a stent, you should avoid having a stent. But sometimes it's needed. Okay. This is an interesting case of a patient. This is the azagous vein. This is the hemiazygous vein. In this patient, you can't see all of it, but the hemiazygous vein was a very significant return flow pathway for a lot of vessels in the uh, mid and lower portion of the spinal cord. And this patient happened to have a lot of lesions, a lot of plaques in that location as well. This was angioplasty multiple times, but it wouldn't respond. Putting all these factors together, seeing all the drainage patterns, its inability to respond to angioplasty, and given the fact that the vessel was of a suitable caliber, such that we knew that there was a very good chance that it would maintain a good flow, a stent was placed in the hemiazygous vein, and in fact this is due to compression by the aorta. Quite rare, especially, you know, quite rare in that it was a significant finding. And, uh, you know, I use this case also as an example to people who, who say, you know, stents aren't suitable for veins, arterial stents aren't suitable for veins. This is a very common stent. We put it in veins and arteries all the time. And you can see how it hugs the wall of this very nicely. Okay, so I, I would, when, if somebody says to you, there's no such thing as a venous stent, I would question them in that regard, okay? So let's talk about probably the, the, the primary reason we use stents in our practice. We use them very rarely, but if, if I were to tell you there's a reason, unfortunately, that we have to use them more often than not, it's to deal with complications, okay? One of, the, unfortunately, the most common complications we see, and I think this is really one of the main problems in Canada, are people who have had stents placed that have been too small or inappropriately placed. As a result, you've had thromboses and all of the subsequent problems, that poor fellow that had to go to Costa Rica. I mean, we all know the story, right? Um, I believe that many, many of these problems are due to inappropriate stent selection and inappropriate stent placement in really patients who are not appropriate for stents in many cases as well. In this case, this is the patient's right internal jugular vein. The arrows um, point to a previously placed stent. 
it was a small stent. I believe it was eight millimeters in diameter. It's much too small to be put in a jugular vein, by and large. As a result, they thrombosed off the jugular vein. So in our practice, we used medicine to melt the clot and mechanical devices to remove clot and spent about six hours cleaning this out. And again, you know, let me back up for a second. You know, part of this, of course, is we always ask ourselves, is there a point to opening this up? You know, do the benefits of opening this up outweigh the risks? And in this person, they did. So we cleared as much as we could. Go ahead, Ashton. And eventually, after six or eight hours, essentially a full day, we were able to restore flow to that vessel. But what, oft what happens in many of these cases where we have a small stent, we have to go in with a high-pressure balloon and fracture that stent. We have to open it up so that we can put a bigger stent in and tack that stent down to the vessel wall. Fortunately, like I said, this is one of the more common reasons we have to use stents, is to fix stents that are, have problems with them. Go ahead, Ashton. Another example of this, the azagus vein. For some reason, somebody put a six millimeter diameter stent in an azagus vein. It's much too small, okay? Problems occur because we don't have appropriate flow. Much as CCSVI is really a flow phenomenon, so is uh, stent patency in many ways. It's a flow phenomenon. We, we can't even think about putting a stent in unless we can use a stent of an adequate caliber. And given the appearance of the inflow to that area and the outflow, we have a fairly good reassurance that it's going to stay open. Six millimeters is too small. We angioplasty it, nothing worked. Eventually, we had to use a bigger stent to fracture that small stent open and tack it against the wall. OK? Um, I'm going to let you watch this for a minute. This is a common thing we do in our practice. This is the skull. Mr. Skull just is turning to your right now. Sometimes on our MRIs, we will um, suspect that there are problems inside the head. This is a patient who presented to us because they had a previous left internal jugular vein angioplasty that failed. And based on our MRI, the patient's clinical history, uh, putting those things together, we had a strong suspicion that the problem with this patient wasn't that the blood flowing out of it had an impairment or that was the only problem. What we're often seeing, especially on the left side, for some reason, we see inflow abnormalities. And this is, an impo I think, another reason why we see a lot of problems with stents is because they're put in as a crutch, perhaps, when there's not a full evaluation of the flow. So in this person, based on um, the facts and the MRI, we went up inside their head. We shot some contrast in, and we could see all the contrast going up around and down the other side. None of it's coming back down this side as it should. When we pulled our catheter back a little bit, we could see the stenosis. It's a narrowing right there. Most of this contrast is going up and being forced back down. OK, Ashton. We inserted a very small wire. It's a wire about the size of a hair. And this wire, actually, we negotiated up into the straight sinus, which is deep in the brain, because we wanted to check that, too. And it's a very small stent. It's a stent. It's about five millimeters in diameter. And we deployed that, and we did another angiogram. And you can see there's a robust flow, a nice full flow past this area where the stent is placed. We tried to angioplasty this. I think we tried it about a dozen times. You know, we don't want to put this stent here. We're going to try everything we can to avoid putting this stent there. It's not a simple decision. We look at where is the flow going? Is flow needed there? What are the downsides of putting the stent there? What are the upsides? But in the end, we felt that the positive benefits outweighed the risks of putting a stent there. So the big question is, with any stent, as with any angioplasty, restenosis. Many angioplasties and stents will restenose eventually. There's no good data regarding restenosis in the setting of CCSVI. You know, as time, you know, we're we're in a a fledgling, a teenage period of CCSVI. It's going to take a number of years, five, maybe seven years, for me to be able to tell you what the incidence of restenosis after angioplasty, what the incidence of restenosis after stent placement in any particular vein is, with some assurance. As I've told you previously, uh, dialysis is a relatively good means of looking at restenosis. 
In the setting of central venous stenosis for dialysis patients, studies have shown a primary patency from approximately 20 to 60 percent. Primary patency means how long it stays open until it first closes off. And at one year, a secondary patency ranging from approximately 60 to 100 percent. There's also been several other studies looking at central venous stenosis in dialysis patients that show longer term secondary patency of approximately 20 to 80 percent at four years. I think more than anything, what these studies show and what the complications tell people like me is that it's very important to be very judicious in the placement, surveillance, and potentially reintervention of patients with stents. Just some general points, maybe summing this up. I would like to disabuse you of the, uh, the idea that putting stents in veins is a new idea. It's not new. It's been done forever. It's widely established and widely adopted. There are guidelines by um, large national medical societies in both, the, in both Canada and the U.S. regarding venous stent placement. To balance that, however, again, there's no conclusive patency benefit to the stents. I'd like to emphasize to you that stenting is never a primary treatment option. It's always about angioplasty. We can do the vast majority of what we need to do with angioplasty, but occasionally, and unfortunately most often, in patients with re-intervention, stenting may be a necessity. In our practice, stenting is approximately 3 to 5 percent of our patients. Most of them are re-interventions. Future stents, there has been some talk about vein-specific stents, and there may be aspects of venous physiology and venous anatomy under which one could um, potentially design a stent that may be better adapted to that. That's years away. Also bioabsorbable stents. In my mind, that's one of the most promising um, ideas. Bioabsorbable stents are stents that provide a scaffolding, but then they are dissolved by the body. Um, recent studies that were actually just published in the last month or so show that bioabsorbable stents have an efficacy somewhere between normal stents and normal metal stents and metal stents that elute drugs. So they're a pretty good option. The big problem with the bioabsorbable stents right now is they don't have a lot of radial force, meaning they're not able to keep vessels open as well as they would like. And this could be a big problem with the very tight stenoses we see in some central venous occlusions. <clears throat> More closing thoughts. Um, so just in general, I would say that stents are suitable for the treatment of central venous stenoses. They're most often used in re-intervention, rarely in az azagous and hemiazagous vein compression, and extremely rarely in, in jugular problems. You know, it should really be a last resort. Stent placement and techniques should be definitely considered um, when we're putting these in. And more importantly, the fundamentals of angioplasty should be upheld. Again, angioplasty is the primary treatment option. Stent placement should be the last resort. I found this cartoon, I thought it was kind of funny and, and sort of speaks to some of the issues going on with stenting. There's a, a football player on the field and there's a surgeon beside him with his knife and it says, okay, you're all set. That stent in your artery will get you through the second half, but I'll need to open you back up after the game. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. So um, maybe putting some names to faces, some of you may have come to see us, some of you may have heard of us. Again. We used to be called Pacific, we are called Pacific Interventional, but um, the division of our, our practice that's devoted towards CCSVI is called Synergy. This is Dr. Harris. That's Dr. Graywall. That's Dr. Arata. And that guy right there is me. Next. I've heard a few of you are on Facebook. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> if you, if you want to, um, know anything about our practice or you'd like to uh, make a post, we have a Facebook page and we're also on Twitter. That's all, folks. <laughs>